Welcome to the course on Design and Analysis of Algorithms. Our topic today is Combinatorial Optimization and Search, and this is going to be the second lecture on this topic. Let me start by summarizing what we did last time. In the last lecture, we gave examples of what we mean by combinatorial search. And then we discussed a fairly general technique called backtrack search. This is sort of the obvious idea, just executed systematically. So let me just summarize by saying that it's a general technique. It will work essentially for every combinatorial optimization problem or combinatorial search problem. And the basic idea over here is to systematically try out all possibilities. The problem, of course, with this technique was the so-called combinatorial explosion. As we explained last time, this just means that the number of all possibilities which we are going to try out is really large. And therefore, this technique typically takes a lot of time. However, for many problems, this is the only way to go. Our topic today is to consider cases in which we can do better. Okay. So today's topic is going to be how to improve upon backtrack search. And specifically, we are going to see a variation called branch and bound. This is going to be the main topic, but we might also see, we might also, we will eventually also look at other ideas called dynamic programming and also greedy algorithms. which are also used to solve uh, combinatorial optimization problems. But this will come later. All this will come later. And we will deal with dynamic programming as well as greedy algorithms at quite some length. And today, we will mostly focus on branch and bound. So the main question is, we know how to do backtrack search. And we'll review it in a minute. How do we make it more efficient? That's really the main question. So let me, let me start by reviewing what backtrack search is. So the idea over here is that we are expected to find a combinatorial object. Let's call it some x star, okay, which satisfies certain constraints. So we know all the constraints, and we, and we require that the, that the combinatorial object x star must satisfy all those constraints. And further, there is a cost function, which is also given for these objects. And we, are, we need to minimize the cost. So there is a set of, set of possible possibilities for x star. And somehow, we have to be sure that we have found the one with the least cost among them. And furthermore, of those, uh, we first find the ones which satisfy the constraint. And from those, we find the one which minimizes the cost. So last time, we said that a good way of organizing this search is to start off with an object, let me call x. x is really not an object in the sense that we have defined over here. x is sort of a template. So x, think of x as consisting of slots which need to be filled. The first slot in x can be filled in several ways. Okay? And correspond, corresponding to that, we'll have branches going out of this node. So the first way of filling the first slot will give me a partially constructed object. Let me call it x1. 
the second way of filling this first slot will give me a partially constructed object x2 and so on. So the first slot can be filled in many, many ways and I will get different partially constructed objects based on how I choose to fill that slot. I can keep going in this manner, say from x1 or from any of these. Now I've, I take any of these partially constructed objects and from these I am going to fill the second slot. So let me denote this by saying, by calling this new object x12. Well, it is not a fully constructed object yet, but two of its slots have been filled okay, or x11, I am sorry. Okay. So two of its slots have been filled. Okay. The first slot has been fill, filled in the first possible way. The second here has been filled in the first possible way as well, but the second slot could also be filled in another way and that another way could be written down in this manner. Okay. So in this manner I keep going and eventually I will get the complete object constructed over here. Okay. Of course, when I get the complete object constructed, I have to stop. So at this point, when I get to the leaves of this tree, I have to somehow stop, I have to stop and at each leaf, I am going to make sure that my constraints are satisfied okay. and then I will evaluate the cost function given to me and then from that I will pick, pick the object with the minimum cost. So let us say the minimum cost object x star appears somewhere over here and that is how I am going to find it and that is the one that I am going to return. We said last time as well that this is a tree which is of often called the search tree. So this tree which is the search tree is explored in a depth first manner. So from x we generate, we fill the first slot and we generate x1, from x1 we fill the second slot and we generate x11 and so on till we get to the end. At this point we check the constraints, we evaluate the cost if necessary and then we go back and then we consider the second way of the next possible way of filling the next possible slot or the same slot. And then we go down in the tree, but in a different direction now. And so whenever we come to the leaf, we go back and in this manner we go through the entire tree going back and forth and this back, this going back gives name, gives the name backtrack search for this method. Okay. So we will have to explore the entire tree and in order to be sure that we have found the best cost leaf, the minimum cost leaf x star. So this is the organization of backtrack search. Okay. Although I have drawn the tree in parallel, uh, I have drawn the entire tree for you, remember that the way a program would execute this procedure, it will only, it will start with the top node and then it will go along some particular path, then come back, then go down again. So at any point in time, it will only be having a certain path in this entire search tree and it will either go down that path or it will roll back that path and then take a different path. That is how the algorithm will execute. So this is the search tree that we mentioned and now the natural question is, do we need to explore the entire tree? This is an extremely important question. Okay. We said that there is combinatorial explosion and that is because the number of leaves is a huge number. Okay. The, the, leave, the, the Coming back to this picture, at every time as, as we go down the tree, the number of nodes doubles or gets multiplied by a large number as we go down and therefore the number of leaves is enormous. So suppose it were possible for us to say that, okay, look, Anything that is underneath this x2 really does not need to be explored and without even seeing anything underneath it. If we could do that, then we would be saving, our, saving ourselves a lot of work. And so the idea that we are looking for over here is called pruning. Okay. So another way of exp uh, expressing the same question is, can we prune the search tree.
So if we could do that, then we would reduce our work, and then we would have a more efficient way of searching. So the branch and bound is just one, one possible heuristic of pruning. It's a pruning heuristic. Okay, so let's come back to this picture here again. So let us say that we have explored this whole thing. We found a certain solution x over here and we evaluated its cost and this cost turned out to be some c of x. Okay, so we went down along the left branch in the tree and we found a certain c of x. Now, suppose this cost function c can be used to evaluate the cost of x, which is a complete object or let me call this say some x bar. Okay, x bar is a completely defined object. Okay. But let us suppose that this cost function c is also, uh, will, will also be able to tell us the cost of a partial object. Okay. So, this is, this is an important idea. So, we are given a cost function c, so say c of say x bar, which gives the cost of a complete object x bar. But suppose c of say some x i j is also defined. So let, let me write this as suppose. Okay. <clears throat> so as we construct our object a little by a little, we can still associate a cost with it. This may not always be true, but in some cases it will be and we are talking about those some cases and we are going to give an example in a minute. Okay. And furthermore, suppose that this extended cost function now has the following interesting property. Okay. So so, in addition to this, okay, so this is the first condition that we need. The second condition is that if say x bar is obtained by extending x i j, then we know that cost of x bar is greater than or equal to cost of x i j. Okay. Suppose our cost function satisfies these two properties. Okay. What are the two properties? That it must be defined even for a partially constructed objects and furthermore, it should only increase as we go towards completely building that object. Another way of saying the same thing is that this is our, our tree. So, the cost function should be defined at every node in this tree and furthermore, it has to only, it has to only increase, actually it does not have to increase, but it cannot decrease, it should not decrease as we go down from the root towards the leaves. Okay. So, if these two properties are met, then we can have a branch and bound heuristic. Okay. So, let me write that down and then I will explain why. Okay. So, this implies that branch and bound is possible. So, here is the idea. Okay. So, suppose I have found some solution over here, a complete object and its cost. And now, I am exploring this tree and I go back and I go back to this point x2. At this point, I will evaluate the cost of x2. Now, if the cost of x2 is itself larger than the cost of the best solution that I have found so far, then something interesting has happened. I know because of the property of this uh, cost function that no matter how I complete this object, how I extend this object into a full object, the cost is only going to increase. But this cost itself is bigger than the cost of the best object found so far. And therefore, there is no point in searching further below x2. 
This is an important idea. Okay. This is the idea of branch and bar. So let's take an example. So my example is the traveling salesman problem. So I'm going to use a very simple graph to explain this, explain how, how branch unbound can be used with, with, uh, with the TSP. So here is my simple graph. Okay. So it's just a problem on four cities. Okay. So here are the edges and vertices in my graph. Okay. This is of course a ridiculously small problem but it will do for explaining our ideas. Let me put down the weights along with this. So maybe this edge has weight 2, let's say this edge has weight 1, let's say this edge has weight 15, this edge over here has weight 10, say this edge has weight 3 and this outer edge has weight 1. Okay, so this is the graph that we are given. And our goal is to find a tour through this graph a tour is simply a sequence of vertices which contains all vertices and this is a complete graph. Uh, and furthermore, the, the weight of the edges traversed according to the tour should be as small as possible. So I'm going to first explain how backtrack search would work on this and then I'll tell you how a branch and bound heuristic will allow us to prune away a lot of the searching. So let us start with the empty, with the empty tour. Okay. So the empty tour is, so these are my four vertices and let's say this is my starting point. Okay. I could have anything as my starting point, doesn't really matter. So this is, this is the starting point. At this starting point, I'm <clears throat> my idea is going to be that I'm going to extend the tour. Okay. So I have been given a partially constructed object an object which represents a tour which is not fully constructed yet. So I'm going to extend it edge by edge. So the first edge I can add in several ways. Okay. So for example, here is one possibility. So I can start over here and I can go down. Okay. So these are my other four, other two cities. So I could have gone down over here. Of course, I could have done something else. Okay. What could I have done? I could have say taken the horizontal edge instead. Okay. This I will explore a little bit later, but right now this is what I am going to explore. Okay. So as we said earlier, the algorithm is going to proceed in a depth first manner. So the algorithm will make a choice that the first edge is the downward edge over here. Next it is going to extend the tour starting at this vertex. So how will it do that? Well, it will consider all possi possibilities out of that. So from here, from here there are two possibilities now. It can either take the horizontal edge or it can take this diagonal edge going back. So let's say it takes this diagonal edge. The horizontal edge will come in somewhere over here. Okay. Then from here, what are the possibilities? So from here the possibilities are that it will go, well it has gone down and it has gone up. And at this point, really, there is only one thing left to do. It has to, it has to go down here again. Okay, it has to go down. And then finally, from here, there is only one possibility, in fact. So there is no, even here, there was one possibility. He, here as well, there is one possibility. So it will go, so this is what we have done so far. And then from here, it will go back. So this is the tour that we, we would have got by doing a depth first search. Okay, so take the first alternative at each step and we would come to this tour. At this point, we would ask what is the cost of the tour? What is the cost of the tour here? So it is 2 for this, 2 plus 1, 3, 3 plus 3 plus 1. So the cost of this is 6. Okay. So in backtrack search, we would just record this 6 and we would say this is the best object we have found so far. What would we do next? Then we would go back from here. When we go back here, we say, okay, is there another way in which this tour could have extended? No, there is no other way because from here, we have to go back to the starting point. So there is no other way. From, so then we go back over here again. 
So at this point, again, we need to ask, is there another way in which this tour could have been extended? Well, even here, there is no other way because we can't go back to an, a town which we have already seen because we have to go through all the towns first. So the only way would have been to go down, which is what we did over here. So even here, there was no other choice. So we come back over here. And at this point, we could ask, well, instead of going in this direction, could we go straight? Okay. So yes, we could go straight in fact, and therefore we would go and we would explore this part of the search space. So from here, instead of going back diagonally, we would go down horizontally. Now from this point onwards, backtrack search would go down and search the rest of the tree underneath it. But here is how branch and bound would make a different decision. Now branch and bound would say, let us evaluate the cost of the tour that we have constructed so far. So what is the cost of this tour? So the cost of this edge is 2, the cost of this edge is 15. So the total cost of this partial object that we have constructed is 17. We know that as we add more and more edges into this, the edge length, the, the total distance covered is only going to increase. And this is based on the important assumption which is that all edge lengths are positive. Let me write that down because that is really an important assumption. All edge lengths are non-negative. If, if this assumption were not true, then we would not have a branch and bound algorithm, at least not the way I have described so far. Okay. But this is a very natural assumption. And so we can conclude at this point that in fact, any possible way in which this tour is to be extended okay, does not need to be considered because its cost is going to be bigger than 17 and therefore it can never beat this best cost tour that we have found so far. So branch and bound would not do any of the work of exploring anything below this. So at this point branch and bound would say, oh I do not need to do anything and I would return back and it would keep the 6 as the only tour that we have found so far and that is the best tour and it would know that with assurance. Okay, so we would, we have essentially proved in fact that nothing underneath over here needs to be explored. What would happen next? We come back over here and then we say, okay, instead of exploring in, in this manner, okay, if in, instead of taking the first edge itself going downwards, let us take it in some other way. So what is another way? It is this way. Let us take the horizontal edge. Again, branch and bound would evaluate what is the cost of this partial tour that we have constructed. What is the cost over here? The cost of this partial tour is 10 because this horizontal edge has cost 10. Again, without exploring things below this vertex, we can safely conclude that that this is bad enough, that we do not need to explore any, anything underneath it. Because whatever comes underneath this is going to be obtained by extending this tour which already has cost 10 and therefore we can say forget it, the cost of anything below this has to be bigger than at least it has to be at least 10 but we already found a tour of cost 6 and therefore we can return back over here and then we can take the next edge and so on. So in any case, in backtrack search, we would have explored everything underneath this. In backtrack search, we would also have explored everything underneath this. In branch and bound, we come to this vertex and we know we do not need to do this work. Also we come to this vertex and we do not need to do this work. And therefore we have saved on the total amount of work that we do. Okay. So let me just summarize this. So let me just write this as a comparison. of backtrack and branch and bound. Okay. So this is backtrack and this is branch and bound. Okay. So branch and bound, backtrack is a general method. Branch and bound needs a suitable cost function. Okay. So and th there might be some amount of cleverness that might be needed in defining this cost function. Okay. 
this may do more work Mo may do more work because more nodes of the tree are visited okay in this there may be pruning and there may be less work less may, there may be fewer nodes of the tree which might get explored in this okay. but there is the small overhead of evaluating cost at every node in general branch and bound if you have a reasonable cost function will work substantially better than backtrack and i might go as far as saying that whenever you can find a reasonable cost function which has the property that i just mentioned you would invariably use it because the gain from the pruning that you get will typically be much more than the overhead of maintaining that uh, that cost function is concerned so let us take one more example before we go on to something else so we are going to look at branch and bound but we are going to look at branch and bound this time for the knapsack problem we introduced this problem last time but let me define it again so the input r is a vector is r two vectors so say v1 v2 till vn okay so we have we have been given n numbers vi represents the value of the ith object and we are also given numbers w1 w2 till wn where wn or wi represents the weight of the ith object and we are given one more input which i'll call c which is the capacity okay so we have been given think of think of it as in this manner so we have a bag of capacity c where c is also measured as a weight so say we have we have been given a bag which can carry at most 50 kg 50 kg 50 kg in front of us are n objects we know the weight of each object as well as we know the value of each object our goal is to select objects such that we don't overflow our bag okay so we don't put too much in our too much weight in our bag which might break it but subject to this constraint we should put in as much value as possible so that's the goal so i want to explain how we will do branch and bound how how uh, how we can implement a branch and bound heuristic for this but before that i will also like to explain i i would i would like to start with the backtrack search very, uh, how how backtrack search would work on this unlike the last problem where there was a natural cost the natural function the natural objective function over here is a different function right so the natural function over here is a benefit function okay so our goal is naturally expressed as maximize total value so this is this is how our object uh, how our uh, uh, objective is is naturally expressed we want to pick up objects such that we get maximum value subject to the constraint that our weight the total weight that we pick up is at most c so how will backtrack search work on this well we need to define the notion of we need to we need to uh, develop this idea that when we construct solutions candidate solutions for this we have to can we do that 
as a step-by-step -step process in which we start off with an empty candidate object and we extend it a little by little so that eventually we have a complete solution. So our notion, so what we are constructing over here is a selection. Okay, a selection of objects which is essentially a subset. So, clearly we should think of this as we start off by looking at the empty subset. Okay. Then the first decision point that we take, at that point we need to we simply decide, do we take the first object or do we not take the first object? Let us make a firm decision. Okay. So, either we take the first object or we reject the first object. So, say let us say we decide to take the first object, then the subset that we have selected so far is consists of 1 and the subset that we have not selected so far consists of 2 through n. Okay. Here, okay, so let me, here there is an additional number which is 1 through n. Okay. So, the point is that our search, yeah, let me just write this separately, this is beginning to look too small. Okay. So, so, initially our search can be characterized by writing down what objects we have selected and what are the objects which are yet to be selected. Okay. So, initially we have selected no object whatsoever. This is the set of objects about which we have not made a decision. So, this is the starting point. Now, the idea is that we are going to make decisions about objects. We will either decide to take an object or we will either will or reject an object. In the first decision point, we will make the decision about the first object. What could the decision be? Well, there are only two choices, we will either pick that object or not pick that object. So, if we decide to not pick that object, we will get this state. Okay. So, we will not have picked any object whatsoever, but the state of the, the set of objects about which we have to yet to make a decision are going to be 2 through n this time. Okay. So, here we have said that we are definitely not interested in the first object. Why are we not interested? Well, there is no real reason for it. This is just one of the possibilities that we are considering. Remember that backtrack search involves just making all possible, involves exploring all possible decisions. So, this is just an exploration of this possibility in which we do not take the first object. The other possibility is that we in fact include the first object. So, here we will have 1 and those objects about which we have yet to make a decision will appear over here. Okay. Of course, we will not be building this set immediately. We will first just make a decision about this and we will come to this point. Then what will we do? then we will we'll make a decision about the second object. Again, there are two possibilities and therefore, we could get something like this. Again, maybe we decide that no, we are not interested in the second object either. So, we will get 3 to n over here or we could decide that we are in fact interested in the second object this time. Okay. So, we will get something like 2 and 3 to n. <coughs> and similarly over here. So, in this manner if we proceed, we will get to 2 to the n leaves which will co correspond to all possible ways of picking subsets of n objects. And then at that point, we could evaluate our benefit function and then we would have to keep track of the best possible benefit function, the, the, uh, the best possible completely generated subset with uh, what its benefit is. Going back to our definition, however, we said that in order to apply a branch and bound, okay, we need to write down 
a proper cost function. Okay. And furthermore, the cost function must have this property. Of course, we could do the same reasoning with a benefit function as well. That is indeed possible, but I am going to take a slightly different route. I am going to keep I am going to keep our definition of branch and bound the same that is we will worry about, co about cost functions rather than benefit functions. And so, now I am going to ex express the knapsack problem in terms of a benefit function rather than a cost function. Okay, so, our original function is maximize value of selected objects. Is there a natural uh, cost function which we can minimize? I could simply take the negative of this, but that negative is not really very interesting. It does not really give us any insight into the problem. Instead of that, why not ask for minimizing the value of rejected objects? I claim that these two are identical. So, if you give me a subset in which the value of the selected objects is as large as possible, I claim that the value of the rejected objects must also be as small as possible. This is simply based on the observation that the total value is fixed and therefore, if you select large value, then you are rejecting a small value. So, this is the key, this is the key to applying branch and bound to this problem. So, now we are going to think of this knapsack problem not in terms of maximizing the value of the selected objects, but in terms of minimizing the value of rejected objects. So, in fact, let us take a numerical example which will make this idea completely clear. Okay. So, our numerical example is that our array, this is our array v. Okay. So, v consists of val values 20, 3, 7 and 5 let us say and w consists of say 5, 2, 4 and 1. So, the third object has value 7 and weight 4 and let us say our capacity is equal to 8 what will the branch and bound tree for this look like? So, originally we will start with no selection. Okay. So, the selected set is this, the, the set about which we are to make a decision consists of all four objects 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Then we make a decision about the first object. Okay. So, let us say the decision says that the first object is not to be taken. So, now we still have to make a decision about 2, 3, 4. Over here, let us say we do make, we, okay. so in fact, let me change my idea a little bit. Let us say here we make the decision that the first object is to be taken. Okay. So, here the decision would be that the first object is not taken and 2, 3, 4 we have not yet really made up of our mind yet. Okay. So, if we take the first object, we would have used up weight 5. Okay. So, now we may need to make a decision about the next object. So, let us say all the left going paths are the ones in which we, we are greedy and we keep taking those objects. Okay. So, what would happen over here? So, we would take the second object as well. So, our bag would contain or our knapsack would contain both 1 and 2 and we will not yet have made a decision about 3 and 4. Okay. And then at this point, we could either decide to take the third object okay, or we could check the constraints remember do not have to be always be checked at the end, we could make the check earlier as well. So, if we decide to check the constraint earlier, if we have already taken the first two objects, 
then taking in the third object would make the weight be 11, which is bigger than 8. And therefore, there is no question of taking in the third object. Okay. So we could say we could definitely go down to uh, 1, 2, and only 4 over here. So we have rejected object 3. Okay. So from this, we will go down to a leaf, which is 1, 2, and 4. This is an acceptable leaf because 1, 2, and 4 are these objects which have weights 5, 2, and 1 which add up to 8. So, our capacity is, is not being violated. The, and at this point, I am putting an empty set over here indicating that all of our decisions have been made. We have made decisions about all the objects. So, we have come to a leaf and we have found a solution. And what is its value? Well, this is an object which we took, this is an object that we took, and this is an object that we took. So, the value is 20 plus 3 plus 5, which is 28. So, we have found a leaf, we have found a solution with value 28. So, now we can go back and we would explore this. I would like you to focus your attention on what happens when the surge reaches this point over here. Okay. Well, this is the, this is the benefit, but we let me just remind you that we said that we are not going to worry about the benefit, right? We are going to worry about the cost. So, what is the cost over here? Remember that the cost is nothing but the value of the objects which were rejected. Okay. So, what is the value of the object which was rejected? Well, the object which was rejected is this third object. And so, the cost over here is equal to 7. Okay. This is the benefit which is interesting of course, because we, in the end we want to report the benefit, but the cost of this solution is 7 in the sense that we define the cost as the value of the object that was rejected. So, if we want to exec execute branch and bound on this, what is going to happen? We are going to evaluate the cost at each particular point in this whole exploration. So, when we come to this point, we will also be evaluating the cost. So, now I would like you to tell me what the cost of this partial solution is. At this point, the object that we have firmly rejected is the first object, right? Because that is the decision that we made. So, what is the cost of this? So, the cost of this is going to be the cost of the object which we have definitely rejected, all objects which we have definitely rejected so far. We may reject further objects in the future, but that we are not going to count. So, the cost of the object that we have definitely rejected so far is, is 20. So, now we can conclude that no further explorations underneath this are really interesting. right? Because as we go down, we will only reject more objects. Well, we will include more objects as well, but remember that right now we are focusing on the objects which we will reject. So, in that sense, if we think of the cost, the cost of this is only going to increase if at all. It is not, it's not going to decrease and therefore, whatever leaf we reach underneath this is going to have cost at least 20. If it has cost at least 20, then what is the maximum benefit that we can have over here? Well, the total value is going to be 20 plus 3 plus 7 plus 5, which is 35. So, the total benefit, the to total value is th 35. We have already rejected an object of cost 20. So, when we come down to over here, our benefit is going to be at most 15. The interesting thing is that we know that even without seeing all possible subject, all possible subsets and that is what makes the method po uh, powerful. So, at this point itself, we can reject the entire subtree and we can say forget it, go back and this has to be the best cost object, the best cost subset. Okay. Whereas, backtrack search would in fact have searched everything, okay. because it is not, it is not keeping track of what is the best and it is not putting a bound on how much, how good a solution we can get. So, again, even in this case, branch and bound will work quite well. I want to give you an exercise.
So basically, if you want to use the branch and bound heuristic, you need to come up with good ways of constructing these cost functions. So we already saw two problems for which uh, we constructed cost functions. In one case, the cost function was fairly natural. In another case, we had to do a little bit, we had to be slightly clever in order to construct the cost function. So let me give you, let me give you a variation of the TSP problem. Say, let's call this the geographical TSP problem or the Euclidean TSP problem. Okay. In the Euclidean TSP problem, what do we know? Well, think of, think of this as the Euclidean or the, or the geographical TSP problem, which means that, in fact, we think of vertices as towns and edges as roads correcting them. So suppose in addition to knowing the road distances, we also know the latitudes and longitudes or the xy coordinates of the towns themselves. So then there is a notion of the shortest distance or uh, the straight line distance. Or which is often called the distance as the crow flies. So this distance is definitely going to be a lower bound on the length of any road connecting because a low road could wind as much, right? If it goes through other towns, it might even be worse, but the road could wind and therefore there is going to be this, di this direct straight line distance uh, which is going to prove a lower bound, which is going to give a lower bound on the distance possible. Okay. So so in addition to the input that we already have, okay, so the input in this case is this distance matrix. Okay, plus all possible straight line distances. Okay. So Using this, I would like you to construct a cost function which will be better than the cost function which we have constructed earlier. What does better mean? That if I give it a partially constructed tour, it should give me a value which is bigger than the value which I had earlier. Okay, now, how, why would that be? So that would have to be because it somehow has to take into account that okay, I have committed to using these edges, but I still have to visit all these towns. And if I want to visit these towns, I will at least have to have some amount of distance added to the distance that I have, I have, uh, I have calculated so far. So in this, so for doing this, the straight line distance information will come useful. So this would be an exercise I would like you to try. So let me summarize again. Okay, so I have I have summarized this. Okay, so let me let me just write down a final word. Okay. okay so there is some cleverness needed in constructing cost functions. Okay. That's that's an important idea, but once the cost functions are constructed, usually substantial pruning happens. Okay. So let me look ahead a little bit. Well, actually, no. Let me look back a little bit. So there are a number of issues which we have not talked about in both branch and bound and backtrack. Okay. So the first issue that we have not talked about is how to organize the search space.
what I mean by this is, let me come back to this example. Okay, here we said that we will look at the first object first. That is not necessary. We could have used some other heuristic of deciding which object to look at first. So, this initial that work that we do might have great payoffs in the end. So, maybe we could say that we want to look at the object which has the highest value first okay, or which has the highest value to weight ratio first. Okay. So, at a given node, which edge to select first, to explore first. Okay. Again coming back to this, at this given node, here we selected the edge in which we included the object. Here we did not include the object. In this case, we explored this edge first and not this edge. And you saw that that was the more interesting thing to do because we got a good, uh, a good object with a uh, good cost. Okay, and as a result of which we could prune this. If we had gone in a different direction, then maybe we would not have got this pruning effect. So clearly, how we which edge to explore first is an interesting decision. So, there are additional heuristics possible for all these questions, both these questions. There are lots of books and there, there are internet articles as well these days which will tell you about these things and which will tell you how the different heuristics work for different kinds of problems. For our next lecture, we will look, we will take a completely different viewpoint and we will look at dynamic programming which is uh, an even more interesting way of finding, uh, of doing combinatorial search and optimization and we will stop here.